Dari anda dah. Uh, a few of us in the in the room today were able to go to a, a day of renewal up in Syracuse on Saturday. The main speaker was Dr. Mary Keeley. Um, she's a uh, PhD in, in sacred scripture. She teaches at a, a Catholic seminary in Detroit, and she's one of three women that the Pope brought into a group to make sure that the church is getting the understanding of the scriptures right. So she's a pretty good credentials and a really sweet lady. Um, she went through all getting her accreditations. Um, she went to Studentville. She went to a lot of really good universities. She has a, a, a master's and a PhD in sacred scriptures. And her story is, even though for many, many years she, she was a scripture scholar and understood the scriptures and loved the Lord and was baptized in the spirit, um, the Lord started dealing with her, uh, calling her forth into a fuller understanding and living out of the gospel. Um, she, she was uh, teaching at a, a, a conference and another guy that was there, his name is Randy Clark, he's really big in the Pentecostal evangelical world. And uh, he, he's got a worldwide ministry, there's a lot of stuff in South America and there's lots of signs and wonders and he really big deal and uh, they really hit it off and they started uh, uh, having a conversation and he invited her to go down to South America to one of the meetings he was putting on and you know this was sort of not her norm it was a little bit of a stretch for her but she, she bought the ticket and she went and uh, she saw things that were just early church things you know sometimes we think that these things were only for the beginning of the church but if you read the scriptures, it's, it says something far different than that. And uh, where it really hit home to her is she was doing another conference and she had to give two talks. And she gave the first talk and, and it was a, a, a perfectly sound, scripturally uh, based talk. But she knew the second talk, she had to go beyond just telling the story. Because she said, telling the story is very, very important. But if the story isn't followed up by power, it doesn't convert hearts okay. and I, I've been I've been the thing that was a blessing to me there's many blessings to being there but um, I told her about what we were being I felt we were being called to do and, and she said yes the Lord is moving in these areas she says but the, you got to make you got to make sure of one thing because the Lord told us uh, several a couple of months ago even though our prayer meeting is this our 45th year we've been meeting, it's gone up and down and all sideways and everything <laughs> for all those years. But he, he said to my heart, the way I hear him, you know, you pray for healing as I've called you to throughout the years, but I want you to pray for healing every week now. I said, oh, okay. And I know that voice. That's the voice that told me so many times to do something and amazing stuff happened when I did what he told me to do. Uh, so she said, the thing you need to, if God is calling you in this direction, and I got this, I got some counsel from Sister Bridget in, in Binghamton, very similar to it, a little bit different, but similar. Um, make sure that the invite goes out beyond the people that just we, we normally meet with. There's a few people today that are, that are on vacation and stuff, and we've got three or four people that are sick. So uh, besides those people that normally come, uh, and, and that's one of the things, Paul and I are going to meet on Friday, and we're going to talk a little bit about the strategy of how to, to move forward with what, he, what he's giving us. Uh, you know, I've been saying over and over, and you know, sometimes I, I think he must get sick of me because I say the same thing over and over again, but I, I'm gonna say it until it penetrates. <laughs> me and you both. And uh, you know, when, when, when Jesus called the 12 and he sent them out, um, he told them three things. Proclaim the kingdom, heal the sick and cast out demons. And then, then he called the 72. One, one of the gospels says it's 70, 70 or 72. And he told them, guess what? Preach the kingdom, heal the sick, cast out demons. Okay, so it's starting to get a little bit broader. And then in Mark 16, he talks about all of us, those that believe. These signs will accompany 
those who believe. So what she was saying and what the scripture is saying, what I've been trying to say in my feeble way, is that we all, because of baptism, have received the Holy Spirit, but that doesn't necessarily mean we've given control over our lives. I mean, he's there. It's like this beautiful gift. Sometimes it's up on the shelf, hasn't even been unwrapped. Then we start to unwrap it. I unwrapped it on, I started to unwrap it on uh, uh, May 11th, uh, Friday before Mother's Day, 1973. And I had a, a dramatic encounter with the Holy Spirit. And it was so profound to me at that point, it just, you know, I say, turn my life upside side down, but Dave Noda from Christlight says, the real motion is he turns our, our lives right side up. And it was so profound, I thought it was like, a, it was, what more could there be? But I found out, low these years, it was a perfect beginning. And every day, uh, if today I hear his voice, God give me the grace not to harden my heart. And what, what is he trying to do in each one of us? He's trying to uh, allow us to surrender to the love and the mercy and the compassion of God so that we trust him to give us the understanding of who we really are. I don't know about you, all my life people have told me who I should be and what I should do. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know any better, so I just tried to do what they said, you know? But I found out, well, you know, there's many years that uh, some of it was spot on and some of it was not spot on. And I, I, I ministered to a lot of people in, in these decades. And I'm finding just a lot of people love the Lord, He's worked in their lives. They've received blessings. Um, they've experienced something of the Holy Spirit, but on so many different levels, they're stuck. Scripture declares in a very powerful statement, Jesus came for freedom, okay? And uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna pray tonight that the Holy Spirit will come and set us free from wherever we're stuck at right now. And thank God we are where we are. I mean, if I wasn't where I was, I, would, I should have been dead four times and I should have been, I probably would be dead again. Uh, he wants us to be able to um, get to the point where we understand that the new covenant, you know, there was four or five covenants in the Old Testament. Uh, and now the new and everlasting covenant went from giving the law, to, uh, the covenant to Abraham, the covenant to Moses, the covenant to David, covenant to Noah, etc., and then the new covenant. Before the covenant went to Moses, it was unbridled retribution. He took something from a village, they come in and they wipe out the village. When Moses got the law and God wrote it on the stone tablets and came down and the glory was so great he had to put a veil over his face, it said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That's a real mitigation of unbridled demolition of the next society. Now then Jesus takes us in the New, New Testament, he took the, the Ten Commandments and then the Orthodox Jews did a whole bunch of smaller ones that they said were part of the Torah and there were 612 of those and Jesus reduces it down to one. Love one another as I love you. Agape love. Loving your enemies and praying for those that persecute. They ask for your coat, give me your cloak. If they ask you for one, go to one mile, you go two miles. If they want to borrow, give it to them. And then the one that really scorches people, if they steal from you, don't ask for it back. Right. Whoa! Okay, now, one of my mentors, Charlie Osborne, he, he lived this, and I heard the message through him down in Pensacola, and somebody stole one of his airplanes one time. He was in ministry, and he did an airplane. He was going over to to get the guy locked up and his wife read the, the scripture that says, uh, you know, if they steal from you, don't ask for it back. <laughs> he told his wife, would you get another translation? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he, but the freedom was that God gave him the grace to not just drive him over because st stealing a plane is a federal offense, it's a felony. He could have had the guy put in jail. By the time he got over there, he had to, the papers to the plane and signed it over to the guy and gave it. Gave it. Now that's courageous. It is courageous. Okay. Uh, 
He was a very wealthy man. He was a multimillionaire. God got hold of him. He gave away all of his money and opened the head of the most successful restaurant in Pensacola. And he just called it the Good News Restaurant. And he just gave the food away. If people could pay, they could pay. And he didn't have to. See, he, he had a radical call. We all have a radical call. It's not, Charlie's call is Charlie's call. There's only one Charlie. <laughs> and he'll tell you, we're all one of a kind of original masterpieces of the living God. So we're not in competition with one another. We should be helping one another, collaborating with one another, encouraging one another, building one another up in faith. And in order to do that, we first have to build ourselves up in faith. So, when I was in 2017, I went to a Christ Life conference down in Baltimore, and Ralph Martin, who's a, uh, been involved in the renewals forever, and he's a prophet in the Catholic Church, and a priest, a young priest came with him, and uh, who was, Ralph was a, uh, he actually, ran the seminary, he was the head of whatever they call it, maybe he was a president or whatever, but there was a bunch of young priests there, and what they did was, they were learning to move in the power of the Holy Spirit, so there was a group of them who would go out, and they go to a supermarket on a Saturday, and they asked the Lord, what do you want us to do here? And he'd show them a vision of a woman in a yellow sweater, so they find, if they see the woman in the yellow sweater, they go up, and they and they pray with them, and people are getting healed all over the place. You see, because, you know what's happening in all the churches, Catholic Church in all the churches? People aren't coming. You're getting drawn aside for a lot of different reasons. Some of it is not good reasons. Some of it is an act of conscience. And they've seen things that hurt them and whatever. And we've all got a lot to answer for, for a lot of things. But uh, that same power that raised Jesus from the dead, scripture says it is at work in our mortal bodies. Peter also says, we are partakers of the divine nature. I mean, the scriptures and the church teach us, the church teaches us the words and the good words, but as long as they just stay words up here, which is sort of mingled with other words that have come into our, our mind that are sort of contradictory a lot, you know, and we gotta have the renewal of our mind by his word so that we can start to see what he's really said about us and start to really believe it and what do we do with it? Blessed are those who heard, hear the word of God and what? How do you get blessed? What do you do with the word of God? You act on it. You act on it. You put it into practice. And that's, that's the thing that's been missing. It's believing. I'm, a, I, I'm in one of the things that talks of getting beyond our shame. I'm beyond the shame of my stupidity and my lack of cooperation with God, even though I've had many people speak into my life, prophetic people, holy people, about what God wanted to do with me, and uh, I just couldn't wrap my arms around it. I thought this could be anybody. <laughs> you can't be talking to me. But you know what I've done? <laughs> but you know who I am? But you know how broken I am and how selfish I am and how unloving I am? And, and, and he says, I, I had you on the book, on my drawing board at the beginning. Beautiful life I planned for you. And yeah, you went down a lot of side alleys and I had to wait for you and I know you had to hurt yourself a little bit and hurt others. And you had to wake up a little bit. But he told me one time, I've given you a great capacity. You used a lot for stupidity. Now I'm going to tell you to use the capacity for good. We all, we've all got some that in our lives somehow. So we've been waiting for a great move of God. I was part of the renewal in the early 70s. It was an amazing thing that happened in the Triple, triple Cities. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of Catholics got baptized in the Spirit. We had great worship. We had a lot of healings going on, good teaching, a lot of priests were involved and stuff like that. Then it sort of, you know, went into different stages. And now we're, there's a great sense that God is going to, is doing another work now that's going to be the greater, maybe the greatest since the early church. Now, Pope Francis in 2017 says, the time we live in is bad. It may not be the worst time in history, but it's bad. But not to worry, a tsunami of mercy and grace is hitting the face of the earth. That's pretty good news. Now, I'm an opportunist, greedy person. 
But when I found out there was a tsunami of mercy and grace hitting the earth, I went in. Okay? But what's the cost for me to get in? What's the cost for you to get in? The cost for you to surrender. Surrender. Ask him for the grace of surrender. And it only comes by when we put ourselves in his presence and we pray. I, I don't know what God's calling you to do. All I'm telling you is he's given me a prescription. And I'm sure he's got a prescription for each one of you. And we need to do it. And we need to stop dancing around with it. Around it, and if we if we have a hard time doing it, I have I found out I have a lot of hard times doing what he's asking me. But because he's brought me past worry, anxiety, and fear, and, and shame about those things, I just go to Daddy and say, "I know it's you. You want me to do this? I have no idea how to do it. I'm just a little boy. Can you help me? Because <laughs> if you don't help me, I'm sunk." And you know what? He's just waiting for us to ask him to help us. And how does he help us? Jesus said something that I thought when I first read in the scriptures was remarkable. He says, it's better that I go. Because if I don't go, I won't get the gift of the Spirit to pour out on me. Can you imagine that? The Holy Spirit, in Jesus' own words, it's better for him to come. Because Jesus was a man. Okay? He was always true God, but he was a man. He was a true man. And he suffered every temptation that we suffer, but he never broke fellowship with the Father. Can you imagine that? Just in your own little mind, real down deep, think about the worst temptations you've had, some of which you resisted and some of which you didn't. Jesus experienced the same thing, and he came out the other side still in perfect fellowship with the Father. And he said, okay, I know you didn't do that, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to tell you a secret. If you confess your sins, I'll forgive you. Well, I mean... We call it good news, but we don't really understand that. Then he says, I'll put my sins as far as the east is from the west. Then he says, I'm going to forget your sins. God's got cognitive difficulty. He can't remember my sins. <laughs> Isn't that sad? But he, as, I, as I say over and over again, the, the fourth part of that, which is the most amazing part, Jesus, who knew no sin for our sake, became sin, that in him we become the very holiness and righteousness of God. Father McElroy told me this 35 years ago. I heard him preach right down in the, in the basement here in St. Anthony's. He said, don't be afraid to look at your brokenness and your weakness because God loved you so much. Not only did he forgive your sin, he became it. So when you look at your brokenness, he's right there. Isn't that good? The worst thing you can imagine. I'm going to look at the worst thing in me, and he's going to be there because he became it. The commitment from God to us is just so immense. Two weeks ago, I, you know, I say, when I teach sometimes, I say things I've never heard before. I said, it, it, isn't that kind, kind of commitment big enough for you to say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus? Amen. Or is this just some kind of a fa fairy tale story? I go to church, and I hear a good story, and I go up, and I beat my heart at the guy that hasn't moved the car yet. <laughs> and we've got challenge. The challenge to love is every day, and your enemies will be those in your own household. They know you love something. Count up your joy, brothers, and every trial comes your way. I read that in 1973, and I said, this is really crazy. Mm -hmm. But I found out that the difficulties we have in our lives, not that God causes difficulties, not that God causes uh, uh, diseases, not that God causes accidents. It's, there's a kind of permissive thing that things need to, I don't understand it, I, it's not above my pay grade. But he allows things to happen so that we realize we need some help and if he gives us the grace and humility we can say lord I'm, I'm in a real pickle over here and instead of me trying to use my half brain to figure out how to get out of it how about you holy spirit you took jesus told me you're gonna he's gonna give you to me and put you put him inside of me that he'll lead me into all truth and it'll t and remind me of everything that you said you know i'm right once in a while He's right all the time. So who should you trust? Huh? And I'm learning it's way, 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 way better to trust him. But how do you do that? Good Council starting a charismatic prayer group every Tuesday starting next week from 6, 6.30 to 8. I believe this fall we're going we're gonna to see a blossoming of things. There needs to be a 
an encouragement of different groups of people that are that God is working with. Um, I, every once in a while, I feel called to go out and visit a fellowship out in Oliva. I've known these people for 40 years. They have a fellowship. Most of them are ex Catholics that formed a fellowship. And uh, they're very loving people and they love the Lord. Hard for me to understand how they do the Eucharist, but I, I don't understand a whole a lot of anything. But about once every six months or so, he tells me to go out there and to visit them. And the last time I went out there and I had a chat with the, the pastor I've known a long, long time. And uh, he says, you know, you're giving my sermon to me. And I said, well, fine. He said, I'll do whatever you want. I'll give me a couple minutes. I'll just go up and do it. You know, he said, let me take over the congregation for that day. I think I'm supposed to do it this Sunday, too. So we'll see. We're about Sword and the Spirit Fellowship. Sword, uh, Sword and the Spirit Fellowship. It's, uh, they have a little place just outside of Louisville. I knew, I know the, the founders of that, Tom Murray and McDonald, were very, 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 very good friends of mine. Very prophetic in my life. So, um, Origen, who lived 185 to 253, is a priest and theologian. Um, nor, it, nor is it I who say this to Christ. Listen to him. From the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, unchastity, theft, false witness, blasphemy. Are you aware of the might, the might of the enemy? army advancing against you from the depths of your own heart. Here are, our enemies are. Massacre them at the first encounter. Lay them low at the first sight. If we are able to overturn their ramparts and exterminate them until no one remains to tell the tale, not one to draw a breath, if not a single one remains to regain its life and raise up again in our thoughts, then Jesus will give us great peace and rest. See, that, that's why uh, Fundamental scripture and what I have been meditating on for years, the weapons of my warfare, our warfare, are not carnal or fleshy, but full of God's enormous power for the demolishing of strongholds and everything that raises its head in pretension against the knowledge of God, taking every thought captive in obedience to Christ. See, most, most of the battle is in our minds. Because, you know, we're, we're body, soul, and spirit. The soul is the will, the intellect, and the emotion. And we've got a lot of really stupid things floating around our minds, not only just because we made bad decisions, but we've been told lies, and we took them in because we didn't know any better. That's why I'm so glad Jesus said at, the, at this cross, we, he said the last couple of things, and he just wasn't blowing smoke because he, he had to fill in the time before he died. He said important things. He said to the Father, Father, forgive Frank, he doesn't know what he's doing. <laughs> Isn't that good? That he doesn't want to leave us in our ignorance. He wants to give us understanding. And so, it's a broad is the road that leads to, leads to perdition, but narrow is the road that leads to life. And a, a nun that was part of our parish, I don't know, maybe 15 years ago, she was from Kenya. She was involved in renewal over there. She's part of Sister Anisha's order. And she came to our prayer meeting. And this is, this is like, I can't tell you how long God's been telling me things I didn't get it. So don't, you know, you're going to get it quicker <laughs> in this day than I got it when I was trying to understand these things. But she said, God's calling you and you're, you're going to go side to side and the road's going to get narrower and it's going to get narrower and you'll understand what he's calling you to. And he's narrowed this thing in the last few years like crazy. And the narrowness to me right now is coming closer to really taking every thought that comes to me and saying, is this thought stupid and not of God? Is this something I should entertain or not entertain? And of recent, and it may happen several times a day, I see this thought coming in because they're temptations. And temptation isn't a sin. You entertain it, it's still not a sin. When you do it, that's a sin, okay? So we don't want to entertain it, but when it comes, if we're smart, and we want to keep ourselves whole, and get more healthy and more healed and not more broken, we're going to take that thought and I say, Jesus, uh, I just take this thought and I lay it at your feet. Tell me the truth of your word about what this lie is trying to divert me from so that I can meditate on your word day and night on the truth. He's the truth. The word is the truth. You see, he's given us everything we need. There's nothing that God has to do because on the cross, Jesus says, it's finished. It says in, in, in the letters, 
the full treasury of grace has been poured out of the heart of Jesus. It's been poured out. We don't have to beg God for healing. He's told us by the wounds of Jesus we've been healed. Now we have to learn to receive that. And sometimes he works through natural means. I don't discount any of that. You know, I had to have a, a crown. I didn't know, he didn't heal my tooth. I had to go to the dentist and pay a lot of money for the guy to do it. But fortunately he was excellent. And his, it took it took a long time this morning. I was getting about an hour and a half in the chair and drawing away and stuff like that. And I don't like that. And so what I do is I just pray the rosary in my mind while we do that. I got through about four four decades of the rosary and then I, I, I always throw a little thing out and, and he, I was starting to start talking about faith and I found out from what he was talking about that he's a real believer and he's got a pretty mature understanding. And then we start having this conversation that I never ever in the world would believe I was having with my dentist while my mouth was open and his tools were in my mouth. Oh, I, I, couldn't I didn't talk until he got the tools out of my mouth. But, uh, <laughs> but things, are, things are happening. If we keep our mind fixed on Jesus, I mean, I would have been happy to go in there and have him do an excellent job, and so I can get out and have a sore mouth for a day or two, and then I go on. Um, but something happened, and, and quite frankly, I am really excited to see him again to see where it's going to go. You don't know. I got a call about six years ago from a buddy that I went to college with, and I, I'm a product of the 60s, and if you've been around, you know what the 60s were. And, uh, and, uh, he, he was a Jewish guy. Most of the guys I went, I went, the gals I went to college with, I went to Harper College. It was, you know, 90% Jewish people from New York. And so he was one. And uh, we, we used to watch old movies, uh, eat, drink frosty root beer, cookies, and smoke dope. I mean, that's, that's what our, our evenings were like. <laughs> <laughs> so this guy calls me and he says, Frank, it's Ron Jacobs. Do you remember me? And I said, sure, Ron, I remember you. We made you bring the cookies or you couldn't come in. <laughs> <laughs> Sick puppy. Mm -hmm. Sick puppy. But anyway, he called me because he had found the Lord and he probably remembered Frank from 1968. He says, if there's anybody that needs some help, it's Frank. And he came, he called me to witness to me. Right. Oh, it was wonderful. And, and I shared with him that I had found the Lord. In fact, I found the Lord earlier than he did. And we've had an ongoing fellowship now for the last six or seven years and we we're about the same age as a couple years older than me. And we're encouraging one another because he's going through things and I'm going through things and we can help one another because we have a lot of experiences that are similar. So God will create folks that are going to help you to build your faith. You need friends. You need good friends that can speak the truth and love to you. Um, a lot of people want to speak the truth and not in love to you. A lot of people want to love you and they won't really tell you what they need to tell you. So we walk down sort of deaf, dumb, and blind, and we don't really know what the, the path is we're supposed to take. So we need to be honest with one another, but we, we can do that asking for the mercy of God, taking these thoughts and getting them out so that we can love one another. Um, Thomas Merton was a great spiritual writer uh, in the last century. Um, he wrote some incredible books, The Seven Story Mountain. Um, he was a became a Trappist monk and he was a novice director down in the uh, Kentucky uh, Abbey down there. And uh, he, he's uh, incredibly brilliant. And uh, he's, he had a couple things I ran across and says, it's my belief that we should not be too sure of having found Christ in ourselves until we have found him also in the part of humanity that is most remote, remote from our own. Whatever you do to the least of the brothers you do to me. See, Mother Teresa was like that. That's why she was so loved by people because the world would give her anything she needed because she she wasn't asking for anything. She just was giving love. You know, I told a story a couple weeks ago that, uh, you know, and three people that have mentored me, Charlie Osborne, Michelle Carell, and, uh, Mother Nadine too, um, and Monsignor Essen, four people, they all had relationships with, with Mother Teresa. And they've all said, well, Michelle said, when you were around her, all you could do was cry. It was just the presence of God. But she was teaching one of her members of her order, a new one, how to treat the least, people who were dying in the streets. 
and she had this other, I think it was another woman with her, and they found this guy and he was dying and he was really, 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 really in bad shape. He had a big hole in his stomach and was full of maggots, and uh, she gave the, the other, knew him, the novice, an example. She took the guy on, his, on her lap, she took tweezers out, and for two hours she took maggots out of his belly, she cleaned them all up, and two, two hours later he died. She wasn't looking for anything in return. We're transactional. I mean, we are. I love you, you love me. <laughs> Jesus says, crowns on his, thorns in his head, back beaten, one strike less of death, nails in his hands and in his feet, pierced side, and he says to Daddy God, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. That's power. That's the power that's falling right now. Though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, coming in human likeness and found human in appearance. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, even the death on the cross. Why Jesus could say, what I do, you'll do and even greater than me is because I go to the Father. Because when he walked the face of the earth, he was always God. He never was not God. He didn't, call, he didn't deem equality with God to say, oh, they're coming after me over here. I could call down ten legions of angels and I'm not going to do it. If they were coming after me and I had ten legions of angels to call down, I probably would call them down. At least a couple. At least a couple. Probably one angel could have taken care of the whole group. But he had the whole resources of heaven. He didn't do it. So he humbled himself and he went and he went into the Jordan. After Jesus was baptized, he came up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened for him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming upon him. A voice came from the heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Now I've read that many, many, many times. When Dr. Mary Healy read it, she, she pointed out something. The heavens were open for him. It never says in the scriptures the heavens closed for him. He walked the face of the earth as a man empowered by the Holy Ghost. Guess what we are? Men and women empowered by the same Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. Do we believe it? You see, we are little Christs, and we may not have the fivefold ministry, but He's given us something. But together, we emulate Him, and that's why unity is so important. And that's why Randy Clark from the Evangelical Pentecostal Wing and Mary Healy, who's teaching at a Catholic seminar, seminary, they're coming together and they're sharing, and they're sharing about what is real in the Spirit. And there's things they don't agree on. But why? Most of the stuff, the, the big stuff, we agree on. We make such a big deal out of, out of the things that we don't agree on. One translation of the scriptures when I was talking about love, and I don't think it's in the current one, it says, love hardly notices when somebody else does wrong. <laughs> Do you ever notice when somebody does wrong? And you want to pound a snot on them? You want to beat them over the head with a, and the Lord said in the Bible, <laughs> Bang! I'm talking about this because this is what I do every day. Is I look at what Paul says about love and I shudder when I get some of those words. Love doesn't have a quick temper. Oh, oh, oh. I'm still dealing with that one. Try to work. Huh? Try to the work. Huh? <laughs> we're we're saints under construction. I'm glad Father Breyer said I forget which one of the. Italian saints, I can't remember who it was, but he lamented all his life that he never was able to overcome his, his Italian temper. And I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. He still was <laughs> You know, I just say, Lord, you know, let me wreak less havoc today than I, than I have in the past. Let, let me bring more of you. Let this be the miracle. And, and what is the world which is in an uproar? The world which is just 
so hard what's going on. What did Jesus say? How are we going to get those people to believe in him? They're going to believe you're my disciples because of what? Because you cast out demons? Because you healed the sick? Because you gave a great sermon? What did he say? Why, why, why are they going to believe that Jesus is for real when they look at us? Why should they? Because they love, see the way they love one another. We got a lot of work to do, folks. <laughs> but what else is you going to do? Father Zemlock, who just died this last year, he always said, he's the only game in town. Once we realize that he's the only game, and that's the game that we're going to be in, uh, engaged in, why don't we say to him, Lord, you know, St. Bernard said, the only thing that burns in hell is self-will, and if you die without self-will, there's nothing to burn. So could you please, through the things that I experienced in my life, the trials, the tribulations, the people that come and say nasty things to me, the people that say truth about me that hurts because I don't want to hear that truth about myself, uh, can I ask for the grace to surrender and accept and count pure joy that trial? Why? Because that allows me to decrease and it allows him to increase. And probably 10 or 12 years ago in our prayer meeting we were meeting down, down in the chapel the Lord said to me uh, another classic scripture that I've just been really integral to me uh, when, when the law of Moses is read they had a veil over their face when the veil is removed with unveiled faces gazing upon the glory of the Lord we're being transformed from glory to glory into the image we behold and the Lord said to me, every time you move from one level of glory to the next level of glory, which I understand is the next perception of the glory of God and of his presence, the next level of understanding, so that we can move on, the door that goes to that next level of glory is shorter and smaller and smaller and smaller because there's less of you and less of you and less of you and less of you. And finally, there's no door anymore because there ain't no more of you. Not in the sense that we don't exist. We're going to exist forever. In heaven, we're going to be known as we are, as we are and we're going to have a new name. <laughs> I'm going to know you as Paul, but i got to find out what your new name is, Paul. <laughs> I still don't know you as Paul. i got so many people up there I'm waiting to see. Brother Chester, Lynn Sussman. We ministered for 40 years together. He was absolutely one of the reasons that I kept trying. I had plenty of opportunities to quit. I had plenty of opportunities to just say, this is, you know, like his disciples, this is too hard. His sayings are too hard. Eat my flesh and drink my blood? We're out of here. What is that about? Love your enemies? If they steal from you, don't even ask for it back. I mean, you got to have, that's what my spiritual director told me about seven years ago. I was fortunate they have a really good, some good spiritual directors. He said, you know, your problem is you rely too much on yourself and you don't have enough courage. I said, oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> All these years. And I obviously didn't know it. I have no idea what to do about it. So what am I going to do? I'm having all these thoughts while I'm sitting down in Pennsylvania with Monsignor Essence, but he's telling me this truth. And he's doing it in such a loving way that I could actually hear it. You know, sometimes we got to hear things couched in a particular way or it makes us a little, eh, you know, not nice. But Frank, when you ran the money changes out of the temple, I mean, isn't there time sometimes when you got to get, get like, Jesus was angry or something? Well, Jesus, you know, you, you can read about Jesus. We think about Jesus was just always, you know, a really cool, nice guy doing all these good things. But he also said to the, to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, you whitewash tombs. He told the truth, but he wasn't always mad. he wasn't always mad. He was righteously angry at things, and he expressed that. and And we can have times when we have that thing too, but we shouldn't be doing it out of a. I'm, he wasn't angry angry because of something that happened to him. He was angry because it was happening to his father's house. It was supposed to be a house of prayer and turning it into the den of thieves. See, he was mad because the will of God wasn't getting done, not the fact that Jesus got hurt in his emotions. 
I'm sure Jesus did get rid of those emotions. They tried to kill him. How many times they tried to kill him? Yeah. Just when walked Peter through, died just, three just times. Just walked right? through him. What? When Peter died him three times. When he was when he was there in front of the uh, little circle, the right? Sanhedrin, and yeah. all the Fire. apostles ran away. And the, and the beauty about that is he knew that Peter was going to do that because God has foreknowledge of things, but it doesn't mean he's making us do it. We still have free will. We got to make the decision. The devil can't make me do it. God could make me do it, but he said, I'm not going to make you do it. I'm going to give you a choice. We've got such a power in our will, but it's not the will alone. It's the will to be united with him that gains the power that transforms things. The power of the resurrection is eternal. And he told Peter before, he says, you know, first one, Peter said, oh, I'm not going to be on the cross. Just get behind me, Satan. You're thinking like men and not like God. Then he says to him, Peter, Satan's asked for you. He wants to sift you. And, and, and in Greek, uh, when he says he's asked for you, it means he wants to own you. But Jesus then says to him, Peter, but I pray for you. And when you're converted, strengthen your brothers. He told him exactly what he needed to do. And Peter hopefully could go after he made that cowardly denial before this little servant girl. He realized Jesus was telling me, he knew I was going to do this and I know he forgives me. He forgave me even before it happened. Isn't that good? He went and he strengthened his brothers. See, God doesn't call the perfect. He is a, there's a second. He doesn't call, call the qualified, but he, he qualifies the call. So wherever we're at, be at peace with that. Wherever we're at, how many times you bumped your head and stubbed your toes or you did things that you're ashamed of, take all that shame and put it at the foot of the cross and say, Jesus' mercy and his blood is powerful enough to cleanse all of that stuff. Now, I can't just take that for granted and go about doing anything I want to do. And that's, that, that doesn't mean you can't do things that you enjoy in life. Yeah, I like to play the drums. I still play the drums a little bit. I love that. Um, I was a corporate manager for a long time, and then I got out of the side sales business, and I really liked selling better than I liked to, to, to manage. I was a good manager, but I love to sell. But he, he allowed me to do that for a goodly number of years. And I, and I did my best to be of service to people about that. But in the midst of it, Peter said, if the door opens, go through it. So I'd be taught, I, I did most of the phone work with people all over the country, and I took a lot of money out of people's hands that I never saw. You gotta have a certain, right, Bob? Not everybody can do that. <laughs> Not everybody wants to do that. But something would happen in the conversation where they had, I could, they had a need, either something was happening in their family or something like that, and I'd say, you know, Gee, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. Would it be okay? I, I believe God provides for us. Could I? Do you mind if I pray with you for that? I never had anybody say no to me. One person said no. Out of all the people I ever talked to, one person said no. And other times they'd say something. We find out that we both share a common belief. So business with them was easy. The next deal came up. With Ten minutes we talked about the deal. It was under twenty minutes we talked about the Lord. It can be. Joe worked with me, I was a director of distribution at uh, Brennan Scott Johnson before I left. And, you know, I had to walk around the distribution center half the day, and it was my office half the day. And I, the, it was kind of big, and I'd walk through it. I spent probably two hours a day walking around Brandon Tons. I don't know if they heard me or they didn't hear me. They probably thought it was a whack job anyway. <laughs> you can, God will, God will, give you times to communicate with him, to be with him. Now, I'm retired now, and even though I've had a, a structured prayer life for a really long time, and I went under direction in the early 2000s, and they got me really solidified to the first hour in the morning, St. Gertrude said, the first hour in the morning belongs to God. I'm just telling you what St. said. I think that you should tie their time, you should pray two and a half hours a day, Mother Mary at Medjugorje told the children over there she wanted to start a prayer group, and she says, um, you can play four hours a day. It's only a sixth of a day. I thought I was extreme. Mama's even more extreme than I am. Okay? I, I just, I, I'm going to send it out to you. I sent something about Pastor Cho um, about how he grew his church over in South Korea. And he had, he has, there's more of a clip of that, and it's just absolutely, totally amazing. 
Um, he learned. It, it's so funny. I met this guy. Somebody wanted me to meet this guy. I met this guy. Really good guy. He was uh, evangelical. He had a music ministry. He was a prophetic guy. He was just to love the Lord. Done a lot of things and, and a lot of different levels. And we were talking about what was happening up in Buffalo because I'm from that area. Uh, what about Lockport, uh, on the Erie Canal. Um, <laughs> Buffalo was, was, was a dying city. Uh, it was really in bad shape. But of recent number of years, there's more construction going on there than they've, they've seen in decades. And it's really starting to flourish. They've got a football team that's good, but not always great. And what happened was, there's pastors up there, and pastors don't always get along necessarily. There's a bunch of pastors that came together, and they went to the, the, the political leaders in Buffalo, and they said, we're here, not to try and get you to come to our church and want anything from you. We're here to see how we can be of service to you. And, and once the politicians understood they weren't looking for something out of their pocket and stuff like that, they started helping him. Jobs are growing up there and stuff. But he told me the story. Was one of the pastors up there, a Pentecostal pastor, I knew the guy, his name was Tommy Reed. And uh, he was over in Seoul, Korea, way, way back when. You know, maybe in the 60s or maybe late 50s. And he knew Pastor Cho, and Pastor Cho had a congregation of eight people. And Pastor Cho, I'll send you the link on, on, on the thing, but Pastor Cho would get in his heart what God was giving him, the, the greatness of what he was calling him to, he ended up growing the largest church in the world. 750,000 people. Going to prayer. But when he was there, there was a prophetic word about him, and then the pastor had to come back, and then Pastor Cho cooperated with the Holy Spirit, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, grew his church to 3,000 people, and then he got stuck there, and he really just was praying and begging God, you know, is this all you want me to do with this? Aren't there more people that you want to bring in? And, and, and the Lord gave him an object lesson and basically told him, you, 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 you're treating the Holy Spirit like something you can use. you got to consider him as your senior pastor and you're the junior pastor. And you got to let him lead. And he conf he's confessed the sin of treating the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's a person. Three persons. He's a person. He can be grieved. Holy Spirit, forgive us. We haven't listened to you. We haven't obeyed you. We've grieved you. And he basically said, Holy Spirit, from this day forward, you're going to be the leader. You're going to be the senior pastor. I'm just going to do whatever you do. And his church went from 3,000 to 7,000 to 9,000 to 7, 8,000, 10,000. I got up to I don't know, 75,000 at the point he was talking, but his church ultimately was going to 750,000. He said he has a dream for a million. He says, I still got 250,000 to go. He says, I didn't do it. He prayed a lot. You got a dream? You got a dream for yourself, your happiness? You got a dream for your family, restoring of relationships? You got a dream of healing or physical? Emotional, psychological, whatever the, whatever the need for healing is. Do you want that? You're not going to get it with McDonald's Lane Prayer. I'm sorry. And I'm not telling you we're in competition with one another. Each one of you has a prescription that God will give you that's exactly what you need to get past your own stupidity. I presume you have some. I've got a lot. <laughs> your own blindness. I'm sure you got some because I've got a lot. And so he can show more light and show you what the path is. And what he's called me to now in the last eight weeks, and I thought it was just, every time he's done something like this to me, I said, Lord, I think it's you, but mm, if it's not, it's not going to last. I'm desperate at this point. I'm joy, I, I got a book I want to write, it's called Joyful Desperation. I am desperate, but I'm happy in my desperation. So the Lord said to me in understanding, it's not like he spoke to my heart like I heard him 
when he told me that he was supposed to go to New Orleans, it's not when he told me that God was going to help me to, to buy my house when I didn't have any money. I, I know that voice, but this was an understanding. And he said, if you're serious about going to the next level and getting a breakthrough, this is what it's going to take for you, my friend. Set your alarm clock at 5 o'clock in the morning, I want you to pray from 5 to 8 every morning. Besides going to Mass and praying the rosary and a couple other things. I said, oh man, Lord. So I, for the first week, I set the alarm clock at 5 o'clock. I don't even set, set it. I wake up at quarter to 5 automatically. I never woke up at quarter to 5. That's what's making me think this is real. You know why? Because it's working. <laughs> it, when he tells you to do something, it works. Don't be afraid of it. We've been so afraid of the things we've been, these inspirations we've been getting. I'm not unique. I'm sure he's speaking to everybody's hearts about stuff. But if you're going to hold on to something that you know is not in his will, for example, two places in scriptures he says this is the will of God. This is the will of God, your holiness, which means to be set aside for his work. It doesn't mean that we're perfect. It means it's we're perfect in the sense that God sees it. You know, I heard this teaching many years ago that helped me. He says, if I, a broom's job is to sweep, okay? If you got a broom and the handle's all crooked on it, but it's still sweet, it's still a perfect broom. Okay. I'm not totally cleansed. I'm not totally purified. I'm in process. But if I do what he's telling me to do, I can experience the perfection of God in that. Not the kind that's going to make me anal retentive about it, but just trusting and getting peace in the things that I'm doing over here. And the other thing he says is, this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, and all things give thanks. Okay, so if you want your prayers answered, you need to get into his will so that he can give you what he wants to give you. He's already died for on the cross, and he's already poured out out of the heart of Jesus, the full treasury of the grace. But he said, unless you forgive your brother from the heart, he can't forgive you. Jesus shed his blood for our forgiveness. But he tells us, if you don't forgive your brother from your heart, I can't forgive you. What is he? What is this? He's telling us how it works. This is how it works. Oh, boy, this person has really done me wrong. And I, I hate that person. We had a gal uh, three or four weeks ago. He went through it for five years after a really nasty divorce and hated her ex and hated his ex-mother-in-law and wanted them to suffer. And she stuck with it in prayer. She went to Christ's life. She got some counseling. She comes to prayer group. Uh, she's had people uh, encourage her. And she said uh, two, two weeks ago she uh, forgave she forgave her mother-in-law and when she saw her and, and said she loved her and didn't hate her. And all of a sudden what happened? She was set free. And she was bound up in pain, right? It's just a, So here, here's, Father, you know all our needs long before we ask. So we're going to ask you tonight, Lord, to give us that perfect grace that we need in our own lives, whether it's a healing, whatever kind, whether it's a new understanding to help us to go deeper into you, whether it's the courage to do the thing that you're telling us to do. So all of us together can move forward encouraging one another on this pilgrimage. And as we do it, we bring more people with us. And that by your mercy and your grace, Lord, somehow they'll see your love manifested in us and they'll, they'll come to believe that you are truly the Savior of the world. Soria vrishiala vlokhtita san jiboro nehanya If you want us to go on the lea, the rete ya noro moro to pishia, etara mama. It's a beautiful old translation, one of the translations, I just can't remember, find the translation, but I know I read it years ago. It said, David, as David asked of the Lord, he thanked them under his tongue. So right now in your heart, your tongue, just make your complaint unto the Lord. Tell him, Lord, I need, this is the thing that's really bothering me. This is the thing I just can't get past. This is the thing I really need. And I'm going to ask you, because you said, ask and you'll receive. If you're ready to believe, you'll receive everything you ask for in prayer. Are you ready to believe that God loves you and he has an answer to you? I don't know what the answer is. I don't know when it's going to come. I don't know how it's going to come. 
All I know is it's going to come. But friend, for as good as God is, and he's always good, you know, if we had a dream team, I'm thinking like in Sodom and Gomorrah, if it was so bad, and he told the people who were obedient to him, get out, he's not going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Because it was so big, there was so much sin in it. Right. Like even with, with the, the flood, when Jesus, God destroyed the whole world because of the sin, and he threw out, you know, the little ark. I mean, you can get to the point, you have to be, so obedience is better than sacrifice. We reap what we you sow. Have to be, we we, we, we reap. always, I don't get me wrong, I know we, we've all sinned and fallen short, but I mean, he says, obedience is better than sacrifice. You have to be obedient to God. That's right. I think he gets to a certain point, like he's destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, he's, he had you know, build an ark, and, and they got out. I mean, I think you can't just think that God, God is always good, but he wants us to be, to, his word is true. He says, I'm not a man and I should lie. So Absolutely. He says, you have to try to, we'll fall, but you have to say you're sorry, because his word is truth. So, I mean, I'm just saying that we just can't, like, say God is certain. He gets to a certain point when I skip. I'm going to destroy us and get out of this anymore. Well, we're going to ask him tonight that to, while we're still here and we have not hardened our hearts against God and we're open to him, even though we may not see completely clearly, that he can give us more light so that we can obey him. Right. Give, the, give us the, I can't obey him on my own strength, but with him all things are possible. That's why he gave us the Holy Ghost. So Holy Spirit, as you ask of the Lord for what this is and you thank him under your tongue, you thank him at the same time. I'm gonna ask you for this and I know you're not deaf and I'm gonna thank you that you're gonna manifest this at your appropriate time. Whether it's this moment or it's a day or it's a week, don't, just trust him. Why don't you ask, thank him. In all things, give thanks. And make this a lifestyle. You do it once, you can do it twice, you can make a habit out of it. When hard stuff comes and you say, Lord, this is a hard thing, but in the midst of this thing, I'm gonna thank you because you're worthy of praise. And Jesus, you told me full authority has been given to you both on heaven and earth. And nothing happens without you allowing it to happen. We know there's a good and perfect will of God. We like to have the perfect will, the most excellent part of your plan manifested in our lives, which is love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, generosity, self-control. Those are the things we want to grow in us. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. We know there's fruit in our lives, Lord, and we thank you for the fruit that's there. We ask you, Lord, that if we got to be pruned a little bit so that fruit can grow some more, we just kneel before you, Lord, and say, do what you got to do. Oh, There's, I just sense the Lord saying that there is some physical healing that's going on right now. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but if you've been seeking healing, of a physical nature, just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The Lord also say, he comes to heal the brokenhearted. Somebody's got a heart that's been broken. Lord, just be who you are, the healer of the broken hearts. I thank you, Lord, that you're just going to raise up a body that's going to be willing to join together in deep prayer according to your prescription for us, O oh Lord. We can encourage, upbuild, and console one another, and we can start to be the body of Christ in reality instead of just in name. You want real <laughs> disciples, Lord. And we, we know what those disciples were. We thank you for David, Lord. Man after your own heart. Murderer and adulterer. Who when the prophet came to him right of the Isle of the riot act, he repented. <clears throat> That's all that God's asking for. Create me a clean heart, O Lord. Establish a right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of my salvation. See to the
Let us, God, give us the courage to believe in the word that you speak to, my, to our hearts. <clears throat> the Lord spoke something to me this week, and I, it's too personal to, I'm still in the process of it, but it was something that I was seeking and hoping for, and the Lord said he was doing it, and I haven't seen it manifested, but now I'm just saying, I thank you, Lord, that you, are, you promised you are doing so and so. It's so much better than fretting about it. <laughs> oh, we fret, we fret, we fret, we fret, we worry, 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 anxious, anxious, anxious. Something that you taught us in, uh, recently and, and ongoing um, is ask the Holy Spirit, how do you want me to pray? You know, for, and you talk about a certain situation sometimes, but I'm just thinking, if we ask the Holy Spirit, what's the next thing to pray for? Give me the grace to pray for it. You can't you can't go wrong, and that was that was uh, that was one of the great uh, things from Mother Nadine. She'd always say, "Just ask the Lord what His prayer is." So we, we thank you, Lord, for what you've done tonight. We thank you that uh, uh, you're moving in this area. We thank you that we were able to come together and, and spend some time. And, uh, Father, just draw us into prayer. Amen. Mm -hmm.